Hi guys, today we're gonna give you a tour of Visegrad Fortress. If you ever visited yourself, you can use this video as an audio visual guide and follow along. And we are starting our tour in front of Tabor Gate. It's a perfect place to start because it's just a couple minutes away from Visegrad Metro stop. The gate was named after a town in southern Bohemia called Tabor. We actually visited it before on our channel. You can check the video out here. The gate was built in 1655. During that time, they were doing complete rebuilding and renovation of all fortifications systems in Visegrad because 30 year war proved that they were pretty much useless. Among the original features of the gate we can see the grooves for the portcullis and the wooden gate with loopholes. Because it was an inhabited fortress they would close the gate for the night so nobody bad could enter and uh, luckily today they keep it open and we can come in. Here we have the remains of even older gate. This one dates back to 14th century. It was called Špička. Špička means peak or top. And it's hard to tell how the gate used to look like by looking at it here. But fun fact, if you go to Petrin and find mirror maze at Petrin, it was inspired by the look of Špička gate. If you look up close, you will see kind of like lines, furrows there. And these are there because that's how soldiers used to sharpen their weapons back in the day. So now we are passing by a couple of houses. This is the house where very famous writer from Visegrad used to live. Her name was Popelka Biljanova and she wrote a book called Visegrad Essays, which is a collection of short stories about uh, legends and uh, myths of Visegrad. I highly recommend it. And guess what? There is another gate. This one is called Leopold Gate. It was named after Leopold I, the Habsburg Emperor. And this one was supposed to be a representative gate to Visegrad, so it's more decorative. And as you can see this road over there, there actually used to be a wooden bridge that would go over the moat. Because remember, we are entering a fortress. And here we are at our first church of the tour. And what a church it is, one of the oldest ones in Prague. It's called Rotunda of St. Martin. You can see St. Martin there up on his high horse. And this rotunda dates back to the year 1100. So it is really old and it went through a lot, you guys. It used to be a prison. It was also bombed by the Prussian army. Hence the cannonballs that they placed above the entrance to commemorate this event. But the biggest threat to this rotunda came much later when there was a construction of this road and they were thinking about demolishing it. Luckily it didn't happen. Now we are sort of on a crossroad. If you go up this way or that way you will be walking on top of the bastion walls but we are going to continue slightly downhill. Let's go. We are passing by the small chapel of the Virgin Mary and this is one of the places in Visegrad where you can only go with a special guide. For that you will have to order a tour at the Špička gate uh, that we saw before and they will bring you inside here and to some uh, other places. If you are not interested in ancient history and medieval history of Visegrad, I don't think it would be that exciting. But uh, we will still link it down below and you can check it out. All right, let's have a coffee break. Let's go. Now we are walking alongside one of the oldest ecclesiastical organizations in Bohemia called Visegrad Chapter, which was established because of a family quarrel. In the year 1070, Bohemia was ruled by Duke Vratislav II, who lived in Prague Castle, which was not a shabby place. The only problem was that his brother, Jaromir, who was a bishop, also lived there. And back then, the church and the state were like this. So all the important decisions had to be done together by the duke and the bishop. The problem was that they did not like each other. They did not get along at all. So Vratislav came up with a solution. He moved here to Visegrad. He established his royal residence here, as well as Visegrad chapter, which was not connected to the bishop of Prague anymore. So he didn't have to talk to his brother, but directly to Vatican. Very smooth, Vratislav, very smooth. This nice little park is hiding something sinister. 
the Devil's Pillars, brought here by Devil himself. At least that's what the legend says, but there are many versions of it. Here's one. A priest who worked in Vyshegrad was supposed to finish reading his prayer faster than it would take Devil to bring a column from one of the churches in Rome to Prague. It looked like the devil was gonna win the bet when the angel interfered and he threw the devil from the sky. The column fell and broke into three pieces and was put here. The reason why these legends exist is because the material that these pillars are made from cannot be found anywhere near Prague. So I guess people always wondered uh, what happened and how did this column appear here in the first place. The second part is that when on a hot day the sun is shining directly onto the devil's pillars, they exude a, a bad smell. It's kind of like a faint smell of sulfur. So I guess people always associated it with something sinister. Nowadays, some people come here to meditate. It's supposedly like a good uh, place for meditation or maybe a really bad one. Maybe they perform here some satanistic rituals. We've never been here at night, so we cannot know for sure. But let's go to our next stop. Here we have a handy map of Vyshegrad, so let's have a look at what we've seen already and where we are going next. We already saw this, which is Tabor Gate. We walked further to Leopold Gate, saw the Rotunda of St. Martin, uh, the little chapel, Vyshegrad chapter, and this part where you can see the church and the cemetery, we are gonna explore a little bit later. For now, we are gonna have a look at the Royal Acropolis which is empty, <laughs> it's just a park. But this is where the palaces of the Czech royal family used to be located. They were all destroyed during the Hussite Wars and never rebuilt afterwards. And uh, since 1620s, Vyshegrad was uh, changed into a fortress. So it's actually hard to call it a castle, Vyshegrad castle, I hear it sometimes people say. It, it is more of a fortress uh, nowadays. But uh, let's have a look over there and uh, explore further. Vyshegrad is famous for these four statues that were originally placed on Palatsky Bridge, but were removed there after the Allied bombing of 1945. And all these statues represent Czech mythical figures. These two guys are Libuše and Przemysl, the legendary founders of the Czech royal dynasty of Przemyslitz. There's a nice legend about them. Libuše, a princess, had to pick her husband to continue the dynasty. Luckily, she was a prophetess, so she just casually saw him in her vision and sent off her men to find him. Uh, they did eventually find him. He was a plowman, so he was actually plowing the land uh, when they discovered him. They brought him to Libusha and then, well, they continued the dynasty. You can imagine. Charles IV, who was aware of this legend, even started a tradition that a Czech king before his coronation had to dress as a plowman and walk to the Prague castle on foot. There is another nice legend that I would like to tell you over there. Perhaps an even more famous legend of Libusha says that she had a prophecy about Prague. She saw a city which glory would touch the stars standing on top of the great hill. And Vyshegrad was believed to be that hill because it was thought to be the cradle of the Czech nation. Modern historians seemed to change their mind about this because the historical records of Vyshegrad go back as far as the second half of the 10th century, while for example, historical records of Prague Castle go back to the end of the 9th century, which means that Vyshegrad is not older than Prague Castle. During the National Revival, though, Vyshegrad was promoted as this uh, place where it all started for Czech people. National Revival was a long process that started in the 19th century, where Czech people basically had to build up their culture from the ashes left after the Austro-Hungarian oppression. And everything that was associated with German culture was considered to be bad and had to be replaced with more Slavic-based culture. Unfortunately, it created a lot of confusion among historians later because people at the forefront of the National Revival seemed to use legends as facts and even forged historical documents. For example, the fictional works of a writer Václav Hayek Libochan were used as facts. So, for example, when he wrote that Vyshegrad was uh, established by Libusha's father, Duke Krok, in the year 682, people really thought that it happened. Nowadays, we know that it most likely didn't. And another place that was embellished by the legends are these ruins behind me, known as Libusha's baths, uh, which uh, most likely were not baths. Uh, they were just part of the medieval fortification because we know that Libusha didn't live in Vyshegrad, let alone took baths with the view of the Voltava River. I see a great city, a city which glory will touch the stars, 
A city with rents so high, nobody would be able to afford them. A city overflowing with beer and urine every weekend. Prague. I realize that we only mentioned uh, one statue out of four, so let's uh, also talk about the other uh, three. Uh, this is the statue of <laughs> Lumir and Pisen, and <laughs> there's actually no great story. He was uh, he was um, a bard, right? And <laughs> it looks like it's some inappropriate uh, relationship age-wise, so we will leave it be. Uh, my favorite one is the one on the right side. And it's a statue of uh, Tstirat and Sharka. I like the legend. So uh, it was a part of this uh, mythos about the uh, women's wars, Divchi Valki, if you know. Legendary war between uh, Czech uh, women and Czech men. <laughs> Uh, so Sharka was actually used as a bait. She was a very uh, pretty lady. She was tied to a tree and next to the tree uh, they left a horn and meat. So when Stirat and his men discovered her, she kind of lured them in, told them that uh, she was punished and tied to a tree to be mocked. And uh, he believed her, he untied her, she gave the meat to all the men to drink. But little did they know that it was full of the sleeping potion. So they drank it, and when they fell asleep, she blew a horn, and all the women came out and slaughtered the men. So the place where it all happened is supposedly Divoka Sharka, and now you can see why it was called like that. Should it teach you something, <laughs> Vatsov, do you think? Don't trust women. <laughs> All right, and the next statue is over here. Is the statue that I always confuse the names. I, I just read it and I already forgot it, you guys. Slavoj and Zaboy. Slavoj and Zaboy. Will I ever remember it? Probably not. And uh, their legend actually was mentioned in that forged document called Zelenohorsky Manuscript. Somebody forged uh, this uh, manuscript and the only person who was calling them out on their <laughs> was uh, Tomasz Garek Masaryk, who was saying that the language that was used in the manuscript sounds too modern, that the ink was too colorful, all that stuff. And everybody was just hushing him, saying that he's a hater, <laughs> that he doesn't believe it. And he turned out to be correct, you guys. The manuscript was forged, but hey, uh, the statue is already here. This is the most famous building of Visegrad, Basilica of St. Peter and Paul. It went through a lot of renovations. The original basilica was built in the year 1070 by Duke Vratislav II, who, according to a legend, brought 12 bags filled with soil on his back for the basilica's foundation, just as Emperor Constantine did once upon a time when he was building the Church of St. Peter in Rome. Today's look of the basilica is neo-Gothic. It comes from the end of the 19th century. We recommend getting a ticket and going to see the interiors of the basilica because they're very pretty and colorful but from the outside you can also admire two mosaics that represent alpha and omega the beginning and the end talking about the end now i will give you a short tour of the visegrad cemetery let's go We are now in a very special cemetery, because this cemetery is pretty much only for famous and important people. So we're going to show you some graves. Yeah, it's a bit uh, creepy. All right, here we have Antonin Dvořák, who was a famous Czech composer. Um, I wish I could uh, sing something. <laughs> <laughs> right now but I'm uh, uh, tone deaf so we are just gonna put his music here hopefully there will be no uh, strike <laughs> for using his music <laughs> you might have heard him before all right let's go over there <laughs> Okay, well, this is the most famous monument on the cemetery. It's called Slavin. It's a collective burial place. Most of the names that uh, you can read there are somehow connected to the Czech National Revival because a lot of them were write writers, sculptors, uh, artists.
panoramic views of Prague are the highlight of Visegrad, so we might as well enjoy it here, because we have over 2,000 meters long rampart walls that we can walk on top of and see Prague around us, everywhere. The walls are actually 4.5 meters wide at the bottom and 2.5 meters wide at the top. And because we are on top of a hill, at some places the height of the walls reaches 18 meters. Don't know what you will do with all of that information. Also, fun fact, Visegrad is apparently built on the shape of Pentagon. Can you see that? I can't. But if you can, let me know in the comments. One of the last things you can check out in Visegrad are Visegrad Casemates. Uh, they're a network of defense corridors that were founded here in 17th century, but largely completed during the occupation of Visegrad by the French army between 1741 and 1742. Yes, it did happen. Casemates are over 1000 meters long and you will have to get a ticket uh, for the tour to visit them. It costs 130 crowns per person, which I think is a great price because uh, the tour is going to be over 30 minutes it's long. I think it's actually close to one hour, but it's been a while since I've done it last. And it was super interesting. They also bring you to Gorlice, uh, which is uh, this big room <laughs> where they even have some of the original statues from the Charlesburg. I think it's very atmospheric and if you're in Visegrad, might as well just do that because it will just add to your experience. <laughs> Well, that's it guys. We explored Visegrad. Hope you liked it. If you did, give this video a thumbs up. I'm not like guiding you in real life, but I'm guiding you virtually. So you can tip me <laughs> as a guide. Okay guys, thank you so much and we will see you in our next video. Bye.